Hello and welcome to the Answer Yes podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Again, many great comments about the uh, the shows, our guests, and what's happening. We are on a roll in 2022. We've had so many wonderful people on here. Uh, go back and listen to some of the older episodes. We, we also have some great people then and influencers like David Meltzer. Even had Sugar Ray Leonard on here about a year ago. So lots of fun stuff. But today I've got Jonathan Brill on the line from Salcedo, California. How you doing? Awesome. Awesome. It's great to be here, my it, friend. Yeah, I appreciate it. You know, when uh, when your bio says, Inc. called Brill, a Silicon Valley legend, he's worked with hundreds of major clients. I thought, well, if I have an opportunity to have somebody that's been a legend in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, we had a lot of tech guys on here uh, in the past, but really on, on all different fronts. And I, I loved and looking forward to hearing from you today about what you do and how you do it. Um, but all my guests get to tell some background first before we dig into what you're doing now. So Jonathan, if you don't mind, give us a little bit of background on who you are and when things started for you, even if you want to go back to childhood. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, so what do I do today? I help companies figure out how to survive and profit from radical change. A lot of it's working with them on strategy, helping them make better decisions and their executive leadership teams. I recently wrote a book called Rogue Waves that's about how to survive and profit from, uh, from radical change. And that's been kind of an obsession of mine since, since I was a little kid. What, why is it that uh, we kind of think that the future is going to be like today, but just a little bit different, and yet it never is? Mm -hmm. you know, and, and what can we know about it? Um, I started off uh, wanting to... to uh, design toys and theme park rides. I did that for a year. I worked for a bit as a photojournalist uh, and got more and more into complex product design and, and designing product platforms for, for companies. And increasingly over the last 15 years or so, it's been helping them figure out how to move from uh, the, the current pool of value that they're capturing into the next pool of value that they need to capture? How, how do they identify that? How do they release the, the floodgates and a way that they can capture it? And so that's, that's what I do today over the last 10 years or so. It's been really working uh, with boards of directors, with CEOs to, to make that transition in their organizations. It started off doing advisory work for companies like uh, Samsung, Microsoft, Sony, uh, IBM. And about four years ago, five years ago, HP gave me a call and they said, hey, we've just spun out uh, our consumer business, our, our notebook computers and uh, PCs and, and printers. And we've got to figure out how to make this organization future-proof. Mm -hmm. How do we prepare for, uh, you know, they were the, the, the prototypical kids in a garage that disrupted the world. And so how do they prepare to avoid that happening to them <laughs> uh, was a specific request. Um, so I did that for a number of years. We helped future-proof the company. And uh, more recently, like I said, I wrote a book about how to do that in your business. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of where I come from and what I'm into. You, you know, when we talk about disruption and how to avoid that, I mean, we've had a lot of disruption in the last two and a half, three years. Um, I know for me, it's been good. For your clients, has it been good? Has it been overly challenging or has there been a pathway that you've seen through the mess and the clutter that, that seemed to have worked? So within that, there's the, there's a deeper question, which is are, when you make every decision in your organization, are you doing it to increase optionality and are you doing it to increase potential or are you doing it to hit the quarter? Mm -hmm. Right. When you play for the long term, it turns out that at least in large size businesses, you have significantly superior economic results over time, over a 15 year period, than if you play for the quarter and, and for optimization. And so that's that's what I recommend. And for the companies that chose to do that uh, coming out of 2008 and, and, and make some adjustments, they've done really well. Uh, and for the companies that are making that shift right now in their organizations, you know, when the next round of disruptions hits, they'll do well too. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I, the, the way I look at this, there's a couple different fronts. You know, I've got several businesses I'm involved with. One, when COVID hit, it, it, I was in the wine business. When COVID hit, everything shut down, right? So mm-hmm. we're not selling any wine. And our strategy there was, well, we have to be in business or stay in business to be in business. And, and what that meant sure. is feeding the kitty to stay alive and get through yeah you know, your words, disruption, yeah. disruption, right? So we came out of COVID, you know, with just our shorts on, but we made it. And now, yeah. I'll, and, and now we have the resources to ramp back up. But on right. the other hand, in my consulting business, um, I looked at that as an opportunity to really ramp up and help people through the process, much like what you've probably mm-hmm. done. Um, mm-hmm. Can you speak to small businesses that are faced yeah. with those types of choices, of uh, what direction to go and, and why. And I know these are all hypotheticals, but people are generally afraid and unsure of what to do in, in a lot of scenarios. So what I suggest, what I recommend, they, these are basic concepts once you get them and they apply to small businesses, they apply to large businesses. Uh, they recognize that in most industries there's some level of maturity and so you're you're typically competing for small percentage gains Mm -hmm. unless there's a disruption and in those moments of disruption that's when the new opportunities really occur and like i said i know more large businesses but for larger businesses uh the the companies that plan for the long term that 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 assume that they're going to be disrupted they tend to do better in the downturn and then they tend to capture that growth and retain it in the upturn Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and so, you know, we did that at HP, but we also did it with my friend's family farm. Uh, in the early 1980s, they'd had a challenge. They, 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 uh, they experienced high inflation. Uh, they experienced the, the U.S. government wanting to move away from family farming into larger system farming. Uh, and uh, then they got hit by a hailstorm, destroyed their crops. Hmm. They went bankrupt. They had to sell the family car. It was one of those stories that's just, you know, it, I mean, it makes me tear up just thinking about what they went through. And when they came out of that, what they did was really interesting. They said, hey, we aren't going to focus on yield. We're not going to focus on volume, which is kind of how you compete in those systems farming businesses. Mm-hmm. We're going to focus exclusively on margin. And we're going to find people that will pay us a lot of money independent of the size of what we're doing so they they have a a customer in las vegas a bartender who uh wants four leaf clovers so they grow three buckets of four leaf clovers for him right and so on and so forth and uh they they built out you know that business so they 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 created a thing where they weren't competing right (laughs) Right. which was really interesting uh and then they started building out a global cool chain so that they could ship anywhere in the world really interesting right so so you can have the same experience if you're the four seasons for i'm just making this up yeah you know or disney or or or, or whoever you know in 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 orlando or in japan same ingredients same quality right right they said hey we're globally diversified right we're diversified we have broad customer base small medium and large so they thought that they were really well set up and then COVID hit and something really interesting happened uh, their restaurant customers all shut down on the same day. And yet over the course of COVID, they doubled the size of their business. Mm-hmm. Why? Because we'd been looking for a number of years at the opportunities for shipping directly to customers. So we had a back of pocket plan for what would happen in, in the hypothetical situation where all of their existing customers disappeared. And so we, they, the organization was able to, to pivot in you know a few weeks and shift over to selling to customers restaurant customers came back uh they have the consumer business by volume they've doubled the size of what they're shipping Mm -hmm. at a time when many of their competitors have had a lot of trouble and so that's the difference between thinking about optimizing for the short term and preparing for anything Mm -hmm. yeah yeah. You know, and, and like at the moment, right, they made investments that didn't maybe rationally make sense if you were a stock market analyst. 
because they weren't making investments for the next 18 months. They were making investments for when, when the disruption occurred. You know, I had a similar experience with my business. I had a speaking business. I still do a lot of public speaking, but I don't know if you noticed this, but conferences stop. <laughs> Slightly. <laughs> um, and I, I, uh, I had this book uh, called After the Next Crash. It was really about these topics. It's now called Rogue Waves. We shifted a little bit for the pandemic. Before the pandemic, people said, hey, that, that kind of disruption you're talking about, that can't happen anymore. That hasn't happened since 2008. And I looked at the stock market. I looked at what was going on in the world. It was like, I don't know. I don't know what day this is going to happen, but it's going to happen. And, and so in November of 2019, a publisher came to me and they said, hey, if you pay us $20,000, you can, we will publish this book for you. I went back to those same publishers in April of 2020. And mm -hmm. they said, we will give you a multi six figure advance to publish basically the same book. <laughs> So, so the point is you want to prepare yourself. You want to have those assets ready for when the disruption occurs because the value shift can be massive, not just as a, as a large business, but as a small business as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm listening to you talk about this and I can't help but think a lot of small business owners allow the emotion to get into the equation so often. You know, you, you see this wave of COVID coming and, you know, using your farm ex as an example, and all of a sudden your customers are gone on day two, the emotion can take over. And it's like, oh, my gosh, we've we got to close the doors instead of looking and analyzing really kind of that that timeline, that preparedness that, that you put it in advance. You know, it's a lot like investing that dollar cost average. You know, let's look at the long haul, that big snapshot and realize, right. like you said, this is a disruption. It's not a, a reason to get emotional over. It's a reason to stay focused on the long-term plan and the pivot uh, that's going to allow you to continue on. And, um, I, you know, I just I, I can't help but think about people getting emotional over things when really the solution is right there in front of them. Do you see a lot of that in the big businesses? Are they so uh, sure of themselves on their long long term? Or are you talking a lot of people out of getting emotional over it? So I think it's hard to avoid being emotional <laughs> yeah. when, when, when it looks like your world is about to end. Um, I, I think the question is really, how do we step back mm. um, from that moment? In, in martial arts, they talk about having soft eyes or soft vision, this idea that, mm. that you're looking, you're always paying attention to your periphery, right? At least as much as what's in front of you. And that's a practice that you build up over time. You don't want to like learn how to like, you know, do Kung Fu when you have to use Kung Fu. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like this is a practice that we build up over time. I, I describe it as big wave surfing, right? You don't want yeah. to take up big wave surfing when the big wave hits. Um, and, and so, yeah, companies, small, medium, and large, they, they go through that same challenge. And they especially highly operational performance oriented companies, right? They tend to say things like you can't predict the future or, you know, that's never happened before, or you, you get a lot of those conversations. And what I discover is actually something deeper that you can start to resolve in your organization, which is that when you study epistemology, which is, this is like your, your broccoli moment for the morning. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, when you start our epistemology, which is um, the study of how we know what we know, there are really four tools for knowing new things, right? There's deductive logic, what, what a lawyer does. There's inductive reasoning, which is what a scientist does, which is looking at, you know, given the information we have right now, what is the most likely thing? There's uh, what's called Bayesian reasoning, which is how you use systems models and statistics mm -hmm. to start to figure out like if something